including attributes and, ob and methods, but that's uh, part of this. So, um, and I'm sure also here there's still a little bit of repetition because I'm sure um, many of you already know what a class is. Um, it defines for us, as we are seeing it now, a completely new type. I mean, we've already seen the basic types like character, integer, float, boolean, an array we've seen as an extra type, which is called a collection of, uh, of, the, uh, of, ty uh, of variables that are all of the same type. Um, now we have a class which is uh, yet another abstraction of that. In C, you would have seen now a uh, union or a struct first. But basically, we don't need to deal with that. A class can cover all of that. And um, that's why I'm immediately jumping to exactly this. So here we can collect now several variables that belong together. And not those, those, those variables or those memory locations that, we, that C++ somehow manages for us, but also methods that uh, do something with this data. So the methodology, so the functions, methods, together with the data, so the variables, are wrapped together in one package, and this is something we call a class. The class itself is something that we can tell C++ about, that this is now a new type uh, that we have defined and that we can use. So we can immediately create a variable of this type, and that is what we call typically an object. Right? So that is, that is all there is to it. So an object is an instance of a class. The class really is a blueprint for C++ to know what to, do, what to do whenever we want to create an object or a variable that is of this particular type. Um, and then this leads to a much more powerful way of programming because you wrap things together a lot tighter. You wrap the functionality together with the actual data that you're using. This is not the same as the functional programming we've been doing up until now, where everything was a main function and the main function used other functions that were either coming from libraries or our own defined functions. In this case, it will be um, more about classes or from now on we'll start using classes. Um, and then there are several principles. I don't want to go into um, a theoretical lecture. That's why I don't want to let you learn things by heart, but basically it makes sense to also encapsulate what is happening within this class. It's very similar to how you um, distribute your code between a header file and a CPP file, where the header file kind of tells everyone who wants to use your code what there is to your code. You know, there it has the comments typically, uh, but also the declarations of functions and of other things that you want to um, let other people use. And everything that you code is in the, uh, the codes of the functions, and so in the CPP file. Very similar uh, thing is happening also in classes, but within the classes we can also hide the attributes and the methods, so the, the, the variables that are part of this class and the functions that are part of this class. And that way, through, the, uh, through this uh, hiding or uh, making certain things private and making other things public, we can kind of deal or we can create an interface with the people who are going to use our class. So in this case, we have an example where we have a class which is called employee. So somebody here created this employee class, which hopefully then creates all the data that is related to an employee, plus also the functionality that this data uh, should have. And in this case, we have an, a very concrete example. This is how we then, for instance, instantiate this class. We have a user, that's the name of our new variable of type employee. It's not that much new to what we've already know, but this time it's a class and an object. And we immediately in, uh, uh, initialize this with a particular name of that employee and some numbers um, that are relevant for this particular application. Now, once we instantiate it, this is something that we'll see later again as a constructor. We have something like this in memory, and it's already filled in with these particular values. Now, what happens and typically in, a, in an application is that there are certain things you can do and certain things you shouldn't do with that data. Now, if you are um, using the, the programming paradigm that we followed so far, typically you have data that you, that you create in your main file or as a global variable, and a data is accessible for everyone. Right? And that is something that is not always that correct or that nice. You might want to hide the data as much as possible. You might also want to hide some functionality as much as possible. 
So what happens then, if you want to use this particular class in the header file, you then see which methods are public, which methods can be used, and then typically also with a bit of comments, to show you how to use those methods. And then in your program, or in the program that uses uh, these methods, you can then say for this variable, or for this object user in this case, we can uh, launch or call this particular function, which in object-oriented program we call typically a method. So the method move to department with a parameter 17 is a part of our object. The same for the change name uh, methods. In this case, we change the name from Carnegie to Carnegie Mellon. Is person married, for instance? And in this case, we can launch these methods uh, that belongs to this object. Uh, this is what the, the basics in, in codes, uh, how, um, how this is done in C++. And this is nice because typically this, uh, these uh, functions, these methods, then allow you to do everything with the data, um, but not uh, the data itself, typically. So typically all of these attributes over here, which are the variables that belong to this class, so name is obviously uh, a string or uh, a character array. Um, this is, for instance, a whole number, so an integer or a long integer. This is well, and this is a floating point or a double, right? But we don't have to worry about that as users of this class. We just have to give it values or uh, get those values back via these functions that are there. So it's the functions, the methods of the class that allow us to uh, retrieve and modify this data. But typically, the data itself is private, and it's not used as such. Later, we'll see that there are some instances where you can actually use some of these instances. So if these instances are public, or if you declare them as public, then those public instances can be gotten just with this dot, uh, like we are, uh, in this case, calling those functions, those methods. But more about that later. But that is a principle called encapsulation. And the nice thing is you um, narrow down the things the user can do with your particular class, with this type that you just invented. The user can only do a few things, and user in this case is the programmer who is using your class and instantiating this object over here, and then for this object uh, then calls these functionalities. Okay, so that is that is uh, what the principle of encapsulation is. So typically we call uh, it's twofold. We have on one hand data protection. So most of the attributes, most of the variables that you have to your availability are always called private, and that means that from outside the class, so when you create an object of this class, you can't get to these attributes anymore. They don't exist for the object that has just been created. Um, and the way to do anything with those attributes is then via the methods, via the functions that belong to this class. And the same goes for um, the internal implementation of your code. So basically, everything that, uh, that shows how you coded something is also hidden, including, for instance, whether what types these attributes are. You know, we basically can uh, modify these types in our classes ourselves, and the user might not notice this. We can go from um, an, a standard string to a C string, to yet another string class over here for our attribute name, but the functions that belong to this class, the methods, they don't change. Their, their parameters might stay the same, but then inherently under the hood, we have changed a lot of things, right? So our implementation is somehow hidden as well to those that are uh, using our, uh, our class. So this is, for instance, where somebody is using our class. In this case, when we want to move this user to a particular department and we say move it to department 17. We know, because this is C++, that this is an integer, but maybe inherently this is not stored as an integer. If there are only 255 departments or less, we could store this as a uint8, for instance. right? And this is something that you can decide as a programmer, and you can change still as a programmer of this particular class. The code that people write with your class does not change in that case. And that is then... Uh, this information hiding principle is also part of encapsulation. And both of those are making code a little bit more manageable uh, and a little bit easier to use. And that's how you then have an explosion of classes that people create, and later we'll see of uh, hierarchies of classes as well, 
to make sure that this is somehow safeguarded. And that alone, as a, as a principle, is already worth going for C++ rather than C, in my opinion. Okay, um, so here's, another, here's an example. So here um, we have uh, an object called here. Again, object is the instantiation of a class. This is basically your variable that we knew before. This is the type of the variable that we knew before, right? So the object here is of class GPS coordinates. And this is somehow perhaps how this might look like if we sketch it. But if you look at the header file, you know immediately how this um, GPS coordinate class is constructed. And you typically have then just uh, the methods that are available to you uh, highlighted as public. Everything else is private and you can't change or you can't even get to that. So in this case, we can, for instance, set the x and y coordinates of our, uh, of our GPS coordinate. That makes sense. Uh, what would also make sense is that you can immediately um, assign those values when you create uh, this object, of course. But in this case, you have a set method that is used for our here objects. We can also separately uh, set the elevation. And also, this is a design that somehow can go on. We can uh, only... Uh, gets a new x uh, coordinate when we also deliver the y coordinate in this case, for instance. And this is a feature, not a bug, typically, because once the x coordinate is, is changed, maybe the y coordinate will also change usually. So this is something that does make sense. Um, and maybe the elevation is then a secondary thing that is not always that in interesting or necessary, or maybe it's always decoupled from the xy coordinates, therefore the elevation of our GPS coordinates is in yet another function. So those are the two mo methods that we can use to, um, to mo modify our data. In this case, our data is a GPS coordinates. And again, how the latitude, the longitude, or the elevation variables inside our class are called is never seen here for the users of our class, of this particular object here, right? And if we retrieve this, there's also um, uh, get latitude and get longitude functionality. There's apparently no get elevation. Maybe you can just set the elevation and then uh, you have here as uh, a feature of this class that a uh, user can never get the elevation for some reason. It might make sense for some applications. But this is then showing those four methods are to your availability when you use this class, and that should do everything for your application. And these methods are chosen in such a way that uh, for the application, they make uh, the most sense. Right? And again, here, we don't know what variables are there in the background, how those are managed. All we see is our methodology and our object here. Right? So as uh, when you want to um, juggle around with these objects, create them, assign them new values, um, copy them, we'll see later as well, etc. Then they are just like variables. And, that's, and they're not m much more special apart, apart from the fact that we combine here functionality and data together. And also the data is completely hidden. We think here about XY coordinates and elevation, whereas the actual data inside the class is called lat, long, and elef, for instance. So, and, and their types, we don't know. Um, and this is, for instance, how you then would produce such a class. So once you want to create such, uh, such codes, the first thing you need to do is then actually tell G++, uh, C++, um, what uh, the class looks like. And it makes kind of sense. You start with a class keyword to notify that what is following now is a class uh, declaration or definition. You have the name of the class, GPS coordinate. Typically, people start with a capital for classes, but it's not necessary. As we've see, uh, seen already, you can start with anything apart from a number, right? And then between the curly braces, you then say, this is the collection of things that belong to this class. And it's always a, co a combination of attributes, so variables, and methods, so functions. And what follows is very similar to what we've already seen. So these over here are the attributes that uh, our class has. And these are here the methods that our class has. And the signatures are exactly the same as how you would uh, initialize a variable or how you would initialize a function. Exactly the same. There's not much difference here. The only thing that is slightly different as well here is this private column and this public column keywords. 
And those do exactly what I said earlier with this encapsulation and hiding. Public means everything that follows the public keyword is public. That people can use when they instantiate an object of this particular class. Private means this is there, but people or uh, objects of this class can't use this. So if you have a GPS coordinate uh, object that you instantiate, like here, as we saw already, then you can't do here.lat and then get its value, or here.lat equals 5, or 5.0. That you can't do. You can't access these variables anymore. The only code that can change or ask these variables once they are private are, is the code that is in these functions, in these methods. Okay? And those are really important basic concepts, but they make kind of sense too, I think. Uh, and once you use it, I think it, it'll, come, it'll come easy. And this is what you would then put into the CPP file of your class. So in the header file, would, you would have this uh, class definition. Note also this semicolon. It's an uh, often made mistake. Um, and then what follows in the CPP file that belongs to this class is where you implement those methods. There is no reason why you should not, or you can implement those methods in the class itself already. Some of you might know Java. That's where typically it's being done. So everything is done in the class itself. In C++, typically people try to separate these two things for the reason I already mentioned. This CPP file should just concern the developer, in this case of this class, not the people who are going to use this class to create an object in their own code. Right, and then for the methods that we saw in the previous slide, we now have what these methods actually do. Um, the, the important thing that I need to say here is basically this is exactly like declaring a function first in your program and then later defining and implementing that function. This is exactly the same, except that here we need to also say or tell C++ this is actually a method that belongs to a class and we need to tell C++ in that case which class it belongs to. If we would leave out this GPS court colon colon and we would just go for void, set, etc., G++ would think that this is the definition of an entirely new function not the method that belongs to our GPS court class. Right? That's why it makes sense that we somehow need to notify C++ that this is a special thing. This is not just a function that we implement here. This is a method that belongs to GPS coordinates. Other than that, there's not much special here, right? We can see that as a function or as a, inherently a function, these methods have parameters of uh, any size, so you can have no parameters, you can have one parameter, you can have 24 parameters. Uh, we can name them, we have to give them a type, and we can also access then our private attributes. Right, so as you remember from, or I'll quickly go back, so let long and elf are doubles that are private. Here, we can get lat and long, and we can assign them a new value in this set method over here. Same for LF here, and over here we can also ask back the, val the values for uh, getting the elevation and getting the latitudes. All right? So what happens is, or what the, uh, again, I'm, I'm go using a very, very abstract way of thinking about the memory still, until we get to the pointers and, um, and references, and then we have to go and delve deeper into what a heap is and what a stack is. But for now, memory is just this huge space in your computer where as soon as you create an object of your class, this new memory is being reserved. And in this case, when we set and, and, uh, or when we change the values of this class and we execute our me the methods of our class, that is kind of kept in memory. So as we done uh, last time for functions, we can do exactly the same for a class in this case. It's a collection, or for arrays as well, in fact. So the new thing is that uh, it's not a three-component uh, three array, in this case, of, uh, of doubles. Otherwise, this would be exactly the same. What is also stored here is links to the functions that belong to this class, and also the name of the current instantiation of the class or object here. Um, and what is important here is that this is, for every object that you create, different. So if you create another object called there, 
then another block like this would appear somewhere else in memory. And the lat, long, and elif parameters, or uh, attributes, sorry, um, will be completely different if we set them to different values. And they will be different spaces in memory as well. And as we, see, we'll see, and as we will see in a second, the functions are also somewhere in memory, but those are centrally managed for the class. So it's not like we then uh, initiate a, or we create for every object separate space for a function. Thankfully not, because the functions are all the same for all the classes of this type, GPS coordinates. Right, and then here just to show you that if we are in a particular function, like we call the set methods of our uh, object here, for instance, as we do here, um, then what happens is a function call is initiated. So we basically open up a bit of memory where we have the parameters of our function, just uh, like we saw last week. And, uh, these pr and, and for the good thing is, or the new thing is, that this function not just has the parameters as its variables or any local variables that we can uh, start here within this function, but it also has the attributes of the class. So the um, lat, long, and altitude as well, or elevation um, in this case. And as we can see here in the implementation, this is actually something I forgot, the elevation is already set to a default value apparently when we set the x and y coordinates, or the latitude and longitude coordinates. So inside these methods of a class, there you can get access to lat, long, and elf over here. You can also get access to the variables that you gave as parameters, or the values that you gave as parameters, because we always pass by value, as we've seen last week. And you can also get here the local variables that are used in this particular function. In this case, we don't use any local variables, but that's also it. So all of that is managed in this blue area, apart from, of course, what is already there for the objects. Right? Um, and then here, just uh, a quick intermezzo. So again, I've seen in um, how you submit your assignments uh, that not everyone is using a very uh, well-regulated indentation. So again, a call for please indent your codes uniformly. It doesn't have to follow our guidelines or the CPPLint guidelines that were set by Google, but please make it consistent. And indentation, I think, should should not be that hard either. So that means for certain things you indent, you put your code a little bit to the right so you can see which code belongs to which, uh, which part of the, of the entire code. So indentation is not necessary in C++, but it's very helpful. Okay. And for classes, we now, or I now will use uh, private, public, and later also another one with one space in front. And that's kind of the minimal thing that you can use. That's why I'm using it. That way you kind of use the less, least amount of characters um, per uh, source file. Right, um, some minor notes, just to make sure that I don't uh, get the wrong, or give the wrong impression here. Not all attributes need to be always private. This is not a rule. You can make any attribute or any methods in a class private or public from, from now on. And later we'll see protected as well, exactly the same. So you can put this, you can also repeat public and private whenever you want. It's not that all methods are always public and all attributes are always private. So you can actually have an attribute two in this case for this test class over here, which happens to be a Boolean, which is publicly available. If that's the case, and if you create an object of this class, you can not only launch these methods over here in the public part, but you can also reach uh, and uh, get access to this particular attribute. So attribute two, we can assign to false. Or attribute two, we can also then give out to the terminal, or we can um, get the value from attribute two. So it is accessible because it is public in this case. Right? So, um, we are uh, it's up to us as programmers to decide what makes the most sense, whether we want to make particular attributes public or private, or whether we want to make particular methods public or private. That's it. Um, another note is that um, we typically split uh, our code in particular files for exactly the same reasons that I've already said last week. 
you want to somehow in the header file always tell people that want to use your code what things look like. And then because of that, typically we will first um, uh, list the public parts and only then the private parts. Unless it's a very small trivial example like here in this test case. Um, but this basically shows anyone who wants to use our class test that all they can use is this attribute 2, method 1 and method 2. Plus the way their plus their signature, you know what, what they are and what they return and what they uh, take as parameters, and then in the CPP file, we can kind of code whatever we want to fulfill kind of this contact over here, and then if somebody wants to use our class in some completely other uh, file again, then they finally now uh, have to just include the header file. Once they do that, they can then start creating their own test objects, like my test over here, and they can do things with the contents and the functionality of our class and the objects of that class. Now, as I said, or I've said up until now that you can choose yourself which methods are public or private. This is not entirely true because there's one specific type of methods that, or two actually, uh, that are a little bit special, and those are the constructors and the destructors. And those are also for our benefit. They make our lives a lot easier. So if you have a variable, typically you can immediately assign it a value, and this is called initialization. So in this case, I say for my code, from now on, I will use the variable my symbol. It's of type character, and it's immediately assigned the value question mark, or initialized with the, the symbol question mark. You can do exactly the same for classes, as we've seen in the very first slide today. So if you create an object, my location of our GPS coordinates, I can immediately launch this with particular values. I can initialize these objects with values that make sense. And in most cases, when you do this, it makes sense to immediately give a value, just like, with, like we've done with uh, the, the variables. Typically, when you use a variable, there's always a certain default value that makes sense. It's not always zero, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's a hundred, or some completely other uh, type of value, but uh, it does make sense to immediately initialize it as something, and it's the same for objects of a particular class. Um, so here are some examples uh, of what we could do, and I think it's, uh, it illustrates that whenever you create a variable, you might always want to uh, have the option at least of uh, initializing this with values, with, with concrete data. And this is, uh, or this requires some functionality in our class. That means we have to code something, because in our code we need to say explicitly um, what these uh, parameters over here mean. So this over here is an object, it's not a function, or it's not a method of our class. My location is the object of class GPS coordinates. But the braces notation kind of hints you already that this is still a little bit like a function, right? Because we pass here parameters to this particular object, not a function or another method. And this is exactly what a constructor is. For most cases, a constructor is exactly like a method, like a function that belongs to a class, but it has two specific things. It has no return value, not even void, so it does not have an int or a, or a float or a bool parameter or a void parameter. There's nothing in front of this. And it is called automatically. We don't have to call it explicitly um, uh, from, um, from our methods, uh, from our objects. So in this case, we have our class tests, again, or a little modification of our class tests with a private attribute one. Um, and where we have our method 2, which is nothing new that we've seen. But here in this case, we have a method with the same name as the class. And that is how we define this as a constructor. And then with um, no one or any parameters uh, that we can add to this. And here we use the concept of overloading that we've seen last week. You can actually use multiple constructors. Um, and what defines uh, the, the constructor you call is really the signature or the parameters that you add to this particular object when you, when you create this object. So somewhere else in code, in the main function, for instance, you create a new object, my tests, 
And by adding these parentheses or braces and saying 21, um, G++ will know, uh, C++ will know, that you're calling this constructor over here, namely the constructor with one parameter that is there available. Right? And as soon as you say, I want an object that I call my tests, and this is an object of class tests, and I call it with the parameter 21, C++ is able to immediately figure out this over here is a constructor, because it has, it, it has the signature of a constructor. You're not doing my test dot something. Um, and it immediately then, through the one parameter, goes for this particular constructor here. Right? And then it will give uh, the attribute 1, the value of the parameter you pass. In this case, 21. All right? And then afterwards, for that my test that you just created as a new object, you can then call a particular method, as before, as we've already seen before. And since this method uh, prints the attribute 1 of our class, this over here will print out 21 uh, to our terminal. All clear? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Very good question. I'll go into that in a second. Please remind me of that. So the, the question is, uh, and I've said just now, a constructor is really uh, a function in most, in most uh, of its features. That means also we can have default values in these constructors. We could have set over here int parameter equals 5 over here. That's the way we've seen you have default parameters for a function last week. Yes, you can do this for a constructor. And this has certain implications because the alternative would be that we would overload this constructor, for instance, with no parameter in this case. And in this case, if we just have no parameter, if we just say we want to create an object my tests, which is going to be called in that case? And that's a very good question. And this could be happening for multiple cases as well. If you have two parameters, and you have a default parameter, then you would be able to call this constructor with just one parameter. And there we follow kind of, or there uh, C++ is um, using something that is still quite transparent, I would say. But yeah, it is possible. It's definitely possible. That's my intermediate answer to that question. Okay. Oh, and I'm starting immediately now. So um, this is, is in, uh, perfect leads into this slide. So yes, you can have uh, multiple constructors that are overloaded. Uh, that means we could have um, a constructor with two parameters. And if we then create an object with two values for its parameters, then automatically this constructor over here is called. Mm -hmm. Right. So in this case, um, or if we would just call it with 4 in this case, attribute 1 would be equal to 4. If we ever, however, call the constructor 4, 12, then attribute 1 gets the value of the second parameter, namely 12, not 4. 4 might be used by something else, right? So it does matter, or this overloading of constructors is actually a feature, but also that needs to be done carefully. Because also there you might have some misconceptions from the people that are going to use your class later on. And typically this is you yourself later as well. And by then you might have forgotten what you wanted to do with this overloading. Also there, there's a lot of room for misinterpretation. Good. Um, there's also default constructors. In this case, a default constructor has no parameters. Um, and um, if... Um, yeah, so basically, if you don't have, a de uh, de if you don't de have this declared a constructor at all, so in the previous slides we have done that several times, before we knew about a constructor, we saw a class that just had attributes and standard methods. In the beginning, our GPS coordinate class, for instance. Then, then C++ will automatically create a default constructor for us, which is an empty function. So it, there is always a default constructor. So even if we go back several slides and go to our first example of a class where we had the GPS coordinates, we could have still added or created a new object of our type of our class GPS coordinates in a constructor way where you have no parameters. So we would have been able to add the braces after the here object, 
you know, kind of explicitly launching the default constructor, although the default constructor was not coded by us, but in that case, C++ will add this. And that's, that's more or less what is written here. Um, and the, uh, yeah, so also there, a default constructor is invoked when an object is created but not initialized. That means if you don't have the braces here behind the my test, also then you're launching the default constructor. And it's exactly the same, whether you would have braces here or not after the my test. As you have a constructor, you also have a destructor. And a destructor is automatically called, again automatically, whenever an object is destroyed. And I mean also that is something that is very important to reflect upon. Uh, we've never explicitly called our constructor here. We just told C++ in our code, we want now a object here of class GPS coordinates and that automatically calls then the constructor. And that's something that we can again code as a method, but it will automatically be called. We don't have to specifically call it with this dot as it's done with all the other methods. The same can be also done with the destructor, but here we don't even need to provide code. We can basically just uh, go into a particular function, like in some function in my code over here, I'm using an object my test of our uh, class test. I initialize it with 17, so the, the constructor with one parameter is being called, and this test object is being filled with some values, and I have some functionality. And then a little bit later, my function ends. As we've seen, for variables, what happens is the variable that is in memory is then completely erased from memory as we leave this function. Because this is a local thing, right? This is the scope in which we, uh, in which we act, and my test over here is nothing more, like, uh, nothing more than just another variable in that principle. So in this case, we, look, we reserved some space in memory for my test. We can do things with my test. But as soon as the scope over here is over and our function ends, our object is also being removed from memory. And sometimes it's required some extra functionality. Um, and in that case, we can do this via a constructor. So whenever this, or when this function over here returns through the return statement, or if it's a void function, you don't need a return statement, then, you know, with a closing curling bra braces, at that point, my test is being destroyed, but before we do that, destroyed, it's being erased from memory, uh, but before we do that, it, there's still a chance for my test to do one last thing, and that is the code that we put in the destructor of my test, or of the class test over here, okay? Um, and the way we define a destructor is exactly the same as we define a constructor, um, and this is basically with the only change that there is a tilde in front of the name of the class that we use for showing that this is a, cons uh, is a destructor. If I would leave out a tilde, it would be the default constructor over here, right? So this, this tilde sign is, is very important. Um, a question that might arise here, I was expecting one, is uh, can we add uh, parameters to this construct, uh, to this destructor? Who thinks, yes, this must be possible? Okay, good. That's perfect. <laughs> um, let's start with uh, an example. I'm not going to code it immediately, because, but I'm going to really urge you to do this for sure, even though this is probably laughable easy, given the last couple of slides. <laughs> However, if you paid attention now, each and every one of you should be able to copy-paste that in their, in their editor, um, fill out a few lines, and then get this working. So the, the, main, uh, um, the main objective of this example is to create a constructor and to create a destructor. So that whenever you use here, an, uh, create here an object in our main function, that you can show that the constructor is being called by saying, what is it, hello? and to show that the destructor is being called by, by saying by in these particular parts of the class implementation. Right? It's not hard, but try this at home. Do try this at home. This example is slightly more, uh, but only slightly more difficult because it also adds uh, a little bit of, uh, of a method and a little bit of an attribute. But if you've gone through the previous slides, 
then those two should definitely not be a problem at all. And you should get the basics of creating and programming a class without a problem. Um, also, these two examples uh, allow writing the class and also the implementation of the class methods and constructor and destructor right over here in one file. So typically we say put it in different files because it's nice. These are just examples or assignments. So just create them in one file. Much easier. And it works as well, of course. G, uh, C++ does not mind if you put the class definition and declaration and implementation all in the same file. It basically just reads from the top to the bottom. Okay, now let's look at the implementation of our maze game. We're now at version 4. Last time we implemented it as a function. As the last iteration, now we're going to imp or show that you can implement this just in the way um, I've done this before. I hope all of you can read this. Let me make this a bit bigger. So our main, main function is still there. But instead, um, so this is the first thing you have to then see in this case. Not much has changed, really. Last time we had some functions that we got from our header file that we included here. So we had some extra functionality. Now we have our maze class that we include over here. IO stream we don't even need here, actually. I'll just get rid of that. Even shorter. Um, and what we do here is we create our maze object. We immediately launch it or initialize it with some values that make sense through a constructor. How that is implemented, we'll see in a second. And we know that this is of type maze, right? So as promised, we can now use maze as just another type, like an int or a car. The difference is that while we are doing this in our program, look here we have our loop until our uh, user presses the Q uh, button, we then draw our maze with the player as this particular symbol and with this particular color pair. That's something that was left over from last week. We could probably also change that a little bit nicer. But uh, we call here a method of our class, which is called draw, and his, has these particular two parameters. And of course, I took the functions that we had last time, and I kind of dragged them into the class as methods now. They're methods, so they belong to the class maze. Then we, as before, ask for the user inputs. Then we have our switch statements. And then uh, in our switch statement, I move up, down, left, or right inside the maze. Uh, not much has changed here. Our main function is uh, surprisingly short. And all, most of the functionality that uh, is associated with the maze is in the header file of the maze and the, um, the according CPP file as well. Um, over here in the header file, um, I think we didn't uh, mention uh, header guards yet, did we? No? I'll tell more about that later when I talk about extras. Um, but, so don't worry too much about those header guards. Um, we include end curses as we had before already in our header file where we just define several functions. Instead of defining several functions or declaring several functions here, we declare our maze class. So our maze class has all the methods that you've seen. We start with the public things because this is what our the, the programmers that are going to use our class are most interested in. It's a constructor with uh, an X and a Y coordinates, which is the coordinate of our player, as we show here through our documentation. Um, we even have a destructor here. The destructor cleans up our NCURSES window. It's automatically called. So also that is a nice feature if you compare this to our version 3, where we had to still call an end window function from NCURSES. And over here we have our draw um, function that draws the whole maze plus the player at a particular, uh, with a particular symbol with a particular color. And that way um, uh, we can redraw our maze and the way we move our player is with the up, down, left and right methods. What this means we'll see in a second, uh, don't mind that. Um, but we have basically a particular method with a return type, with a name, all these four methods don't have any parameters, and I put their implementation straight into uh, the class declaration, as you can see over here. There. Right? So that, that is not much new. Um, also, don't mind this over here. Um, we have here 
I mean, this I can now tell already, um, constant is a constant. That's something we saw in the very first week. We can, of course, declare a constant uh, in our class as well. Uh, we're perfectly fine doing that. So also here I have uh, two constant um, signed 16-bit integers, uh, which depict the length and the, or the size of the maze in the x and the y uh, coordinates. Then I have our maze ourselves. So basically this is the, the two-dimensional array, which will show where the walls of our maze are. The player, um, um, the player position, right? And um, I have another method for clearing the screen, which is private. That means this clear screen method over here cannot be called from the maze game.cpp file. I can't do here ma maze.clear screen because we assume that our that the people doing this would never need this. We'll just use this as a helper method here in our class. Okay? That's a very good question. How do you use this function over here in any of the other methods of this particular class? So any methods of this class, in this case our draw methods, but also our constructor, our destructor, up, down, left and right, in their implementation you can mention the clear screen. So I could do clear screen right here. That is valid. Okay. The compiler would not complain. If, however, over here, I would do maze.clear screen, the compiler would definitely, oops, the compiler would definitely complain because this is a private method. And maze is an object, so it can only, over here, um, call public methods, not private ones. But excellent, I mean, keep the questions coming because this is, I think, essentially not that hard, but it just needs to be click and making click. Right, and then in the CPP file, I have the actual implementation of all the methods that I promised uh, in the header file to implement. And as you can see, they always are preceded, or the functions are preceded by our class name, so maze, colon, colon. So this can be distinguished from any other function that might also be called draw, right? And not be a method that belongs to the class maze. So this is a method that belongs to the class maze. It's called draw. It has these parameters. And this is what it does. And actually here it does call clear screen, right? So that's where we use it. Um, and I've, I, yeah, and clear screen is actually this uh, method over here. Um, note over here that in the CPP file, you don't need to note here whether this is private or public. This is only something that you need to um, write in the header file. Over here, we have the destructor. So as soon as our main function ends over here, so this is our function. As soon as this returns over here, this object over here is destroyed. That means all the memory that was taken by maze is wiped out. But before we do that, we call our destructor. And the destructor does something useful here. It makes sure that the window that we open through NCURS is then closed again. That's one example of what uh, a destructor can do. And the nice thing is, in the maze game.cpp file, we don't need to explicitly do this through a method. The destructor does this automatically. And then over here, the constructor is huge because I'm doing something a little bit strange. I'm creating here um, a uh, uh, almost, I could have uh, made this a static, a static um, an array over here that I immediately fill and assign with particular values. And then I copy from this array to our attribute array. Why do I do this? This comes later. Um, and then there's another question that is coming up in a second. I now have here as parameters x and y. And in my class, I also have the attributes x and y over here. This is the nicest and shortest form of dealing with this, I would say, because whenever we create a maze, we want to say what the x and y coordinates of our player are. So we could start saying player x and player y here, and then we don't have a problem. But if we want to keep things short and elegant, then I would say x and y should be possible, right? The problem is that this x and y over here are the parameters of our constructor, which is nothing more than a method, really. A little bit special, but still. 
However, as we've seen, whenever we go into the, uh, the, the code that defines these particular methods, we have these two x and y's, but we also have access to these two x and y's over here. Yet, they have exactly the same type and exactly the same name. It's still possible to do this in C++. However, and or there it's still, uh, it is possible to do this, and the reason why it is possible to do this is because the way we access then the attributes of our class for every method is done via pointer, and only that is something I can explain next week. But it means that there is a difference between this uh, variable x over here, sorry, this x uh, over here, and this x over here, whenever we are in a particular method's body. Right? So, for instance, in our constructor over here. So if we are over here and we, for instance, say x equals 9, then we can do that. But this x equals 9 is point, or then the x that will change its value is the actual x over here, the, the parameter that was given to us through calling our constructor, this particular method over here. The question is, how do we access then our attribute x that belongs to our maze? That we will see is a pointer. That is something that we'll see much or next week. But then today still we'll see that there is this way to access uh, very specifically our local attributes with this and then this arrow. So a minus sign and then a bigger than sign. Um, and this is basically the way to differentiate between the x and uh, the x that is provided over here and the x that is provided as an attribute to our class. And this is something that happens in many, many cases. Whenever you write, want to write a constructor, you have an attribute that you want to, for instance, initialize, or you want to do something with. In that case, it makes sense that they have the same name. So why would you make the distinction? Now, there is different ways. So we could have changed in our class the attribute over here to an underscore x. This is how some people will do it. The underscore is then a sign saying, look, this is our attribute, our class attributes, and this x over here is what we use in our constructor as a local parameter. That is one way of doing it. Exactly, that too. Um, but there is a way to, to circumvent that, uh, that, way, that, that, uh, that methodology. This is, however, provided by C++ already, so this, I would say, is the more elegant way of doing it. Um, it's uniform, it will work everywhere, um, and it allows us to, for instance, do this. Uh, so this x over here is the parameter that you provide in your constructor. This x over here is the attribute that you provide for your class. Okay, so that's how this needs to happen, or this is how uh, I implemented it here. So this x is x, this y is y. Okay, that's typically the way you do it over here. Any question? Yes? What is the importance of uh, having class names before the constructor? Because like, both the class name and constructor name is always same. That's a very good question. I mean, I, I like your thinking. So basically, yes, you could have said, or the people that, uh, that uh, set this standard could have said, if you do this, then this will always point to the class maze. However, this is just the name of a function now. Right? Um, and it's a function that doesn't return anything, so they could have done this, perhaps, but they didn't. They chose to make sure that this is exactly the same as a method with two tweaks, you know, with one being it does not have any return value. Yeah. It's, it's a semantic thing. Yeah. But a very good question. Right, and then whatever else we do in this constructor, apart from what we just said, is exactly the same as what we've done in the initialization function that we created last week, okay? Um, as a piece of homework, because there's, uh, so this is already giving away everything that I ask in the slides, I would like you to think about this solution over here, and if there are not nicer solutions, because this is, of course, not very nice. Our constructor is blocked with this, um, with this local array that we now certainly, suddenly um, initialize. And then the values of this uh, local array we give to our, um, our, or our array that is also the attribute in our, uh, the, the attribute in our class, right? Is there not a nicer way? 
So the homework is for this assignment is check whether you can't find something better here. Okay, that is uh, all about the maze game for now. Um, some other things that uh, I wanted to then illustrate, and with the this pointer, I already illustrated this. So for many cases, and in our maze case especially, um, you want to have or you want to use short, adequate names, and then you might usually have an overlap between your attributes of your class and your parameters in a constructor, especially in a constructor. But it might also be in the methods, for instance, get and set methods uh, would be an, uh, an example there. Um, so it, it does happen, and it does happen more than um, one might think at the beginning. So the way to do this is through this, uh, this pointer. So in this case, if we are here, how do we make distinction between this x and this x? Well, the this pointer is exactly the way to do this. As, lo as long as this x is preceded by the this and then uh, this particular symbol uh, sequence, then we are talking about a class attributes. Uh, if not, then we're talking about something local to our function. In this case, the parameter over here. Yeah. So that is um, uh, what is happening. Now, a side note here, and th this I think I already uh, said already, so whenever we create um, an object of a particular class, then this object is being created into memory, and it basically has then access to its own data members. If you don't have uh, this um, dual situation, then if you just if you wouldn't have these parameters, for instance, then an x would directly point to our attribute x, right? So it has access to this x over here. Um, but they also share a single copy of the function of the class, uh, of, the, uh, of the methods of the class. And this is a, an implicit pointer that is passed at, the pr at each method, including also the constructor. So for all methods that you have in your class, you can think that you have these parameters that you explicitly tell C++ are there, but attached to this is always this this. And this this is basically kind of pointing to all the attributes of your objects. So if you have the here object, which is of a class GPS coordinates, then this, this pointer over here would point to the location in memory where our here object is stored and to the attributes that, that belong there. So the latitude, the longitude, and the elevation of this particular here object. And, and that's how you can think about this, this pointer. It's something that is implicitly added as a parameter to each method in your class. And that is so important that I put another slide to make sure that this is exactly uh, sketched over here. Yeah. So really, we don't here have just uh, uh, the two parameters for setting the x and y coordinate of our GPS coordinates. No, we actually have a hidden third parameter, which is our this pointer. And this, this pointer allows us to then access via this lat, long, and elf. It also allows us, that's something I said already before, it also allows us here in set to use lat, long, and elf itself, of course, without the this pointer. But through the this pointer, we can, um, uh, for instance, here use lat and long as parameters instead of la and low, which is a little bit silly in this case, right? And of course, this point is not just for the attributes, it's also, or it is for, um, for everything that you would have to your availability in this class. Again, more about that later when we explicitly look at what pointers can do and what they're usually used for. Um, da -da -da. This is a short notation for initializing something. And there is, up until now, one case that we've seen where this is really important. So whenever we initialize, or typically we have an, uh, when you have a constructor, you will always want to initialize something. And you could do this in the, uh, in the body of the constructor. There where you put all the statements that make sure that you can assign x, uh, or attribute x and attribute y, the value of x and the value of y over here. C++ allows you a short notation, which is this one. And in this one, it is even clearer than with the this pointer, I would say, what is going on. Whatever is in front of the braces over here is the attribute of the class. Whatever is between the braces is the actual thing you passed, so the parameter x over here. The same for this. This is the 
attribute y, this is the parameter y. Looks a little bit crazy perhaps, but um, it is a way to quickly define that you're basically initializing x with x and y with y in this case. And the way the sequence is done, or the notation is here organized, we know that this is the, these two are the attributes, and these two over here are the parameters. And this is so short that most people use this. And the nice thing is that you don't need to ex explicitly say here, this pointer x equals x, this pointer y equals i. You don't have to do that. You can just type it here. Much faster, much easier. There is, however, an, uh, an implicit uh, a distinction between what you're doing here and putting that, uh, the this pointer thing over here. Namely, this over here is an initialization. This over here is a series of statements that do an assignment. And in, many, and in some cases, there is a really big difference there. For instance, if you have a constant. Uh, okay, so uh, minor uh, uh, thing to note is that sometimes you can also put, or not sometimes, you can always put also the curly braces here. Also, that is a possibility. It's exactly the same. Um, and then what I was going to say is sometimes you have constants. We've seen that example already in our maze example. That's why I programmed it the way I wanted to program it. Uh, and I showed it to you. So we have uh, the X and Y size of our maze as a constant defined in our maze class. So that's what I wanted to do. So therefore, I, want, I don't want anyone to change this constant uh, value over here, so I declare it as a constant. Just like we've seen constants in the beginning. Right? That's what we can do, and what we sometimes should do. And the problem is, however, um, in our constructor, so if we define it as such, we can't assign this inside the body of the constructor because this is an assignment. And as we've seen, once you have uh, initialized a construct, uh, constant, then you can't change it anymore. It's a constant, you can't change it. So therefore over here, what are we trying to do here will result in a compile error because we're trying to change our constant, right? So this, up until a previous slide, we did not know how to solve. But this new notation will make this possible because this over here is an initialization. And it is a valid way of doing things. Okay, so this is um, are there, there, there's this as a very founded um, way of making sure that constants in your class can immediately be initialized and not be assigned like here. This would go, would go to private or public. Over here? Yeah. Yes. So you initialize a maze object, and then immediately what you provide as a parameter, or in this case, we actually uh, don't initialize x and y, which is a bit strange. But anyway, we have, we have 10 and 15 over here. Um, we, that, that happens in our constructor. Right? So, so, in our, so nothing has changed uh, from the code that I showed you earlier. So we create our maze objects with uh, um, 15 and 10. Over here, we could have also done x and, 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 and y over here instead of 15 and 10, really. Um, but it is exactly the same. Yeah? OK. Yes? Uh, would this still work if, uh, had there been an uh, assignment in the, in the class previously, and then you're reassigning it here, would this still work? Uh, OK, the way I understand this question is, what if you would do this for the declaration? So if you have this declaration over here with this notation, and then you assign it like this over here in the body over here. No, no, you, you uh, initialize the constants previously, and then you are trying to change them uh, in this reassignment process. Oh, you initialize them here. Ah. Yes, yes, exactly. I'll come to that as well. Of course, that is a possibility. So yes, you can initialize constants over here like you would do in your codes. Up until now, we haven't done that, but uh, yes, you, uh, we will see that this but is a possibility. That no, then uh, again, that would be a very conflicting situation, of course. You would give it uh, a default initialization over here, so maze x length would be 10 and, uh, and y length would be uh, 15, for instance, over here. 
Um, okay, now I understand why these are 10 and 15 over here, because they're different from the X and Y. I'm getting confused by my own codes here. Uh, so this is the player location. This is not the size of the maze. This is the size of the maze. Um, so if we would then try to do exactly this later again, of course, it would be conflicting. You know, what are we trying to put as a constant value here, this or over here? Yeah. But, um, and that's something we will see later. You can, of course, also add uh, default values over here, which are also, and that is, I think, uh, uh, the good thing about this question, is also an initialization, not an assignment just like we've seen already for our variables. Right, next thing is uh, static members. Now, we haven't seen static yet uh, for good reasons, I think, but, I mean, um, you might have seen it already in C, perhaps, um, where, you, where you might have seen this in a, in a C class or in a C++ class as um, a, a type of global variable that you can locally um, uh, address. Um, but static members is something different. So, typically, uh, you have uh, a class, when you create a class, and sometimes an attribute is not something that is very specific to this particular object that you're going to create of this class, but it's something that belongs to everything. Um, and for our GPS coordinates, there might be a particular uh, attribute, like a precision, for instance, I call this here precision, that will show the precision level at which we are working here. And this will, for instance, then impact uh, something in our method, methods that we use of our class. So we have here a variable, or it could be also a concept, but we can perhaps change it. So it's here a variable, which we name prec for precision. And we call it that it's, a, or we say here that it's a static uh, attribute or a static member. Um, and the, 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 the new thing that we haven't seen yet is here that this precision over here does not belong to here, which is an object of our class GPS coordinates. It also does not belong to there, which is yet another object of our class GPS coordinates. It belongs to both of them. There is one that is being shared to all objects of our class. And there's many reasons why you might want to do this. So sometimes there are certain things that are not belonging to the objects, but are things that belong to the class that you still want to have as an attribute, as, um, as a variable that you want to change, that you want to uh, assign, that you want to do something with or uh, call uh, or recall. Um, but that is uh, uh, yeah, central to the class. And that is called a, a static member. Um, and this is basically how we could use this. So we have here and there. So the default constructors are being called here for our two objects of class GPS coordinates. And then we can, because uh, we said that this is a public static attribute over here, we can actually assign this a new value, for instance. And then this is assigned. And if then here is then addressing this attribute, then it will print out 0 0.02, even though we change it for there, right? Look at the T over here. It's a small difference, but it's a very big one because we're talking about one object, not the other one. Yes? Uh, why exactly do we have to do like a static uh, then in front? Because if you would declare it, for example, with the int prec is equal to something, mm -hmm. you could um, open it as, as, uh, as well with there. You could open it, but it would not be the same value. Okay. So the value here is 0 0.02 for both of them, even though we change it for one. Okay. So it is basically one, and you know, look at the picture. I hope my sketch is kind of, uh, is getting through. So there's only one precision. There's only one block over here that we can read and write to, basically. Uh, and this is addressable for all the objects of our class. Right? But it's a good question because it brings home the real difference between an actual attribute or an, a an attribute and a static member or static attribute. There's in C++ so many different names for the same thing, typically. I try to cover all of them here in the slides. Uh, but they're also sometimes called static members, static attributes. Right. Um, and the special thing here is even if you don't create objects of your class, you still have this to your availability. So before we can create an object here or before we can co uh, create an object there, we still have our, our precision that we can use. 
and they are declared in a slightly different way that we've seen as well. Because if we would not have this static, you know, this would be not that much different to a normal attribute, right? You would have this just static in front of it. However, what you need to do as well, this is just the declaration of our static member or our static attributes. We need to also implement it. And that is done typically after the class declaration. So after our class over here, for instance, in the CPP file or straight after here, if you use the same file, we need to explicitly say what we're talking about. That we have a double that is belongs to our class GPS coordinates and that this is a thing called precision. In this case, without the braces means we have an attribute. And over here, we don't mention that this is static because that was already mentioned over here in the declaration. It makes sense because this is a declaration and this over here is basically implementing what we declared, right? That is the difference. But also that is a typical mistake that people make. They think, oh, I'll just put static in front of it and from now on, I move this precision from here to everywhere or make it available to all um, objects. This is not the case. We need to do this. Uh, we need to define this explicitly after the class declaration. Um, and this is just to show, um, okay, so these are not the same aesthetic variables as we've seen them, that I already said, um, that we will also talk a little bit more in the next week where we talk about how memory is managed, so, um, um, what the other meaning of static can be. Um, and over here in this, um, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Pum, pum, pum. No, I'm just using uh, or showing what, uh, um, what I could do here, I think. I'm not entirely sure what this means. I'm changing here the precision in a, in a method, but that is not the case. I mean, I think, okay, let's, yeah. So let's go to this example, just to give um, a very crude example or the simplest, very quick example, because we don't, there's not that much time. Uh, so we go, for example, to and I'm making the assignment for you, um, if, if you then uh, pay attention. Um, so basically, the, the, but it's a very simple one. So basically, we need to create a class, um, and we don't say what class it is or what name we class is. So we call it something like test, for instance. Um, never forget a semicolon when you declare a class. Um, and we only need a class with one static member. So nothing else, no constructor, no attributes, one static member. That means from our slides, we need to proceed this in the declaration of a class with static. And then we can just create our member, name a type, integer, i, for instance, that is it. So there's only one i um, for any object of our class tests, right? That is what happening and that is everything we need to know about the declaration. Then we need to also define this. Um, and then we do this by saying there is an integer. This belongs to our test class. And this is called i. And that's it. Right? So that is the definition. So again, reminding you of, where is it? This slide over here. So I'm doing exactly the same. So I had an integer of our class called i. Right? And earlier we had our static integer i. It's exactly the same footprint in a way. Right. So what I can do now is do not create an object here. Creating an object would be doing test t, for instance. Now I would have an object t of our class tests. That is what we explicitly should not do. That's what the, the objective is. The objective is to actually change the value, or what is the, oh, no, I deleted it, so do not create an object here, but assign a value to a static member here, so we should just give it a value. So now I need to assign the, um, the value of i um, uh, to this uh, particular object, object, and that is, again, not that easy. I can't just start using i here. I need to make explicit that we have an i that belongs to our class tests, right? And for the rest, we can use or assign it a particular value like a 77, for instance. And I can print a value here. Um, I can just squeeze it in between here. So over here, tests i can be done here. Oops, test over here, which would enable us uh, to, 
to do everything with our class without actually having an object of our class. That is a special thing here. We never created an object T of uh, class tests. We just messed around here uh, with this one particular static um, member or static attribute. Test group on. Sorry? Should it be dot i? Yes, of course. Sorry, I'm completely messed up here. Thank you very much. So, um, and that is that is what should work. I mean, I would have um, seen it if I would have done this. Perhaps it's still making a mistake. Let's see. I'm going to here for tests. Oops. Can it use the dot operator on a type? I think it is colon colon, no? Or am I now? Ugh. I is a private member. Ah, okay, but that is it. What did I forget? Exactly. Um, and this is, I mean, okay, this is again um, a side road here, but typically the class, or in this case, a class is very similar to a struct, if you know the struct already. It's basically, um, I, I could have uh, replaced class with struct and created a structure that does exactly the same here and called it a test. So in this case, it's not really an object-oriented uh, paradigm that we are following here. Okay, let's try that again. Now it works. Right, so uh, I was right, it is colon colon. Um, and it makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because we're never, um, I'm so basically if you have a member and you do the dot operator, then you basically say the member is accessing the attribute or it's member, uh, addressing the methods. Um, the colon colon means we're actually accessing the whole class um, uh, attribute over here, right? So thank you for that misinformation. I should not trust <laughs> everything you say. But you have already a pretty high uh, success rate up until now, right? Um, so if I um, execute this, indeed I changed uh, the static member, right? And then we can actually afterwards, for instance, so from now on I can actually also say we want uh, to have an object of, of our class tests. So I have T over here, and I can then print again what is the member, and this time I have to put a dot here, um, uh, that we have to our availability. And I can do this because it's public. Again, that is something that is very important. I probably have to say here, um, um, object T has the, well, as, as a value for i, and then uh, the operator here to make sure that we have a nice string to get. We recompile, we execute again, and we see that at a point there were no objects, we put this value as 77 for all the objects of our class, then we create an object of our class, and it's still the 77. Now, mission accomplished, right? So basically, that is the use of a static member, um, and also that is something we'll see increasingly more later, especially if we also go into certain um, design patterns. All right, good. That is uh, what that example was about. Now I'm going to very quickly, because time is ticking, um, the next things are just some examples that we finally know how to use them for now. So uh, up until now, we've seen that a string is inherently an array of characters. When we use the string class, nothing has changed really, except that we use the nice class that C++ provides us or that people from uh, the standards uh, or from this IO stream library or via the IO stream library provide to us. So now, from now on, we can use std uh, colon colon string, whoops, as our class name. So we can create now an object my first name of class std string. And this is a string. And we can immediately initialize this as John. Or we can assign this to Do, which is, again, this is a constant string, as we've seen last time, when we talked about character arrays. And then the nice thing about classes is that we can create, and there's something we'll see also increasingly later, uh, methods that are special because they use an operator. So in this case, they are called operators that belong to a particular class and that we can redefine to do certain things. So in this case, my string is a new object yet again, 
where we assign this to um, the, the, uh, the my first name, so John over here, plus my, my last name, name Doe over here. But this plus operator is basically in the background, very similar to a method that takes this and this and concatenates this and returns uh, a new string. And this new string is basically um, assigned to my string over here as an object. Right? And that is more similar to the higher level languages that you might know already. You know, you can just create a string, you can assign it, you can concatenate it, you can uh, report the length of a string, you can find something in a string, like a substring, that, and then the location of the substring is returned. You can compare two strings, etc. Right? So this is the thing that uh, many of you already probably uh, know about from Java or Python. Right? So this is something that uh, typically people tend to use. Well, now we can use this also in C++. Um, a, a side thing, a side question that often comes um, usually later uh, is, um, so strings have a typical encoding, and you might know this UTF-8 UTF encoding already as a, as a concept. So whenever we tr create our text file, we can, in, in our text file, you know, start typing Japanese or Arabic or any type of very strange characters that are definitely not in the ASCII table. I'm sure you know, because ASCII table only has a very few amount of, uh, of space. So what typically ha ends up, uh, UTF-8 end up doing is by escape sequences and then of, uh, a sequence of bytes is um, creating the ability to um, depict all of these extra uh, signs over here, right? And that is what is nice because we can use, you know, all the languages in the world or most of the languages in the world. Uh, but we need to use this uh, in, or we need to use more information here. So characters tend to be uh, sequences of multiple bytes, even though strings, again, are an array of characters and a character is only one byte, typically. So very early on, people started thinking about, well, let's use bigger characters. So wide characters, they were called. And then an, a sequence or a, a, an array of white characters is then called a white string. Click this link and then you'll go down the rabbit hole of what uh, complicated things then start to happen. In essence, uh, it is completely different. If, uh, you know, should you use a W string? In Linux, for instance, no, you don't need to. In Windows, yes, you have to uh, in many cases. Um, and then because of that, in subsequent standards of C++, people have been also specifying how much um, a white string is. So if this is uh, an 8 byte, 16 by, uh, uh, an 8-bit, sorry, 16-bit or a 32-bit unsigned string, um, but all of that is really still a, quite a mess between the different platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, 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 the things that people wanted to solve here did, are not really solved. But here's an example of what you could do with wide strings um, and with normal strings. But what we tend to do here is basically still encode things in UTF-8, meaning we are still stuck to these normal characters. And we're not really using wide characters or characters that are bigger than just one byte. Oh, this over here is a big L. It's, it's to show, because of course, we have here a white string. This over here is a constant string. And a string we know is an area of characters. We can't assign that, or I think it's not possible, no, to assign this to a white string, because a white string is an array of white characters, completely different types. So therefore, we need to have... Uh, some suffix over here, no, sorry, prefix over here this is the big L over here to show that it's actually uh, not a normal string, but a white string. Again, this link over here will provide you with more. Um, but yeah, but a good question. So basically, it means that this is a constant white string, whereas this over here is a constant string. Yeah. And this locale is yet another thing that is, uh, can be really uh, maddening. But I'm not going to delve into that. But I just want to make you aware that there are these uh, um, endeavors to go into this direction. 
Um, files are quite important. So typically you can create files within your code. You can also read files within your code. For instance, for reading the values for an array, as we've seen earlier in our maze example. So here are some examples of how you can deal with a file as a stream. Um, now I'm not going to go into what a stream is. So it, I mean, I think from, the, from using the stream and later when we look at the operators, you will see all the details, but it's exactly like our C out, you know, our terminal output or a console output. You can also output something to a stream and use exactly the same notation. Um, so again, you use this particular operator, so smaller than, smaller than, to send something to the, to the output from a, a particular file. But you can also send something to a file stream to output this, right? So that is a way you could read a file and then you can uh, write uh, it, the same contents to another file, for instance. Okay, that is just, uh, and then the last thing that I want to uh, stop with, and unfortunately it's already two o'clock. Um, so this is a nice nifty preview again of what can happen later when we finally look at templates without knowing what templates are, because they're hidden in this particular class. So this is a tuple class. In many applications, you want to combine things together, but um, you want to explicitly say this over here is a tuple with particular operators and particular methods that define a tuple. In this case, you can do this in this particular way. So for instance, you want to have um, a database of people, like similar to the employee example that we started with today. So we want to store James Smith and a particular um, ID, for instance, that belongs to this person. And you can say, I want to create this as a tuple. So as a piece in memory that belongs together. And then automatically, my user over here will, will be created with these particular values, with a string, another string, and a, and a double over here, because these are constants of a particular type, right? And they are done via this make tuple function that is a part of the standard library, which creates this tuple for us. And then what you can get, what you can do is an access those individual elements of this tuple with either the location, you say at location zero, I have my first name, and I, I, at location one, I have the last name, right? And this is location two over here. So get, and then between those smaller and bigger than braces, you have then the number. So this is zero, this is one, this is two as location in my tuple. Or I could also address the type, if, but only if I have one and exactly one of those. So one of those three is a double. So I can say, get the double of my tuple of this particular uh, tuple that I have, and then out comes this particular number over here, which I think is a very cool way to immediately get started with a particular data structure and then being able to change the data in or address the data in this particular data structure. Just as an example, and, and what is in, in the back of this is a class as well, which uses templates and that's something we'll see much later. What you can also do, however, is then use structure bindings. This is something that is new since uh, standards 17, in which you can do something like this. So if I have now my user objects of this uh, tuple class over here, that is returned by this make tuple function, right? That is what, 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 uh, what, is, what is happening here. Then I have my user and I can immediately decompose my user in and then assign the values that are in, uh, my, use, in the my user objects straight to new uh, variables that I immediately create. So I create an F name, an L name, and a height as my new variables that I use in this particular main function. And through this auto, they are immediately assigned the right type and immediately are assigned the right value. That is very short and very elegant, I think. Okay? Right. And since we're... Oh, okay, any question? Yes. That is a very good question. No, not like this, not as, as we've seen over here. You can just create a tuple saying, you know, there is this particular person with this name, this last name, and this, uh, this height over here. What you can do is copy it and then modify it while copying it, for instance. So you can basically create new tuples on, this, on the spurt and then get the, the values of those. Okay. So what you, what you modify is the tuple itself completely. Afterwards, 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very good. Very good question. That comes later. Yeah, but but an ex excellent question. Typically, you're not doing it like that. Yeah, but but uh, but a very good question. Yeah. Any other questions? No, doesn't seem to be. Okay, perfect. Then let's take now a break until quarter past. That means eleven minutes that we have until we start with in class assignments. Thank you very much for your attention.